Okay, I'm going to be totally honest with you people. This is the third time I've recorded this lecture. Uh, the first time I recorded it, I changed a lot of the slides because they were crap and it could they were just grainy. Looked like I was shooting them on a 1972 Polaroid with old film. So I had to update it, so I moved everything around. And when I recorded it, I realized I had screwed up all the captions. All the captions were in the wrong places, and some of them were just wrong or filled with horrible errors. I don't know. I didn't have enough caffeine when I did it. So I decided the best thing to do was just jettison it, start over from scratch, and so I recorded it again. And this time, I didn't realize I had the mic off for the whole time. So I recorded it a second time, but it was gone. So this is time number three. I am... A heavily caffeinated beverage of choice is Coke. I'm subsisting on Chip Ahoy cookies and let's just do this. Okay. All right. Let's talk about the Bronze Age of Chien. Okay. Here we go. So this is the Mediterranean. This is the usual satellite map of the Mediterranean. And this area right here under the red circle is the Aegean. So the Aegean is defined by basically the eastern coast of Anatolia, which is now modern-day Turkey, and the tail end of the Balkans, which comes down into Greece. Now, we tend to think of Greece as this chunk here, but that's modern view. In ancient times, Greece was really defined by the Aegean, and it was really this section here, and it was on both sides of the Aegean Sea. They were a seafaring people. So just to orient you down at the bottom, we have the big island Crete. In the center, we have these little islands called the Cyclades. And we have this uh, peninsula over here called the Peloponnese. Uh, this is where Sparta and Mycenae are. Then we have Attica. This is where the modern city of Athens and the ancient city of Athens was too. But we also have Ionia and Dor Doria over here as well. In the Bronze Age, uh, the Aegean is really complicated because... Unlike Mesopotamia or Egypt, where we more or less have just one people, we have three different groups, and we're not even entirely certain how these are related. So on the mainland, we have a group of people we call uh, the Mycenaeans, uh, or the Helladic peoples, and they're located here in the Peloponnese and the Attic Peninsula. Their capital city is going to be Mycenae. And down to the south, on the island of Crete, we have the Minoans. And their capital city, or at least it seems like their capital city, is a place called Knossos. And then in the Cyclades, these tiny little islands in the center, we have another culture. Uh, and again, we're not entirely... We know that the Mycenaeans, the Helladic peoples, are definitely Greeks. They're some of the first Greeks to actually enter into the region. But we're not certain if the Minoans or the Cyclidic people are Greeks. Uh, or even if they're Indo-European, they may be something else. On the far end of the uh, Cyclades is a tiny little island uh, called Thera, more commonly called by the tourists Santorini. Uh, and on it is a uh, Bronze Age Pompeii, a city that was buried under a volcanic explosion, which is always a bad day for the people who live there, but a good day for us because it saves all of this information. A little bit about Aegean chronology. It's a mess. And it's basically based on pots. Uh, pots change styles, just like fashion changes styles over time. And then these pots get broken, they get buried, and the older stuff's on the bottom, the younger stuff's on the top. So these strata give you a kind of way of dating things. So if you go to another site and you find a pot that looks like uh, a pot over here, you can guess that they came from roughly the same time. Emphasis on roughly. Because we have very few hard, fast dates in the Aegean world. We have no historical information or very little historical information, so all of this is relative. And so we break Crete down into early, middle, and late Minoan. We also break it down into palatial because they have these palaces and there are periods where the palaces are building and periods where they stop building. In the Greek mainland, it's very similar. We have early, middle, and late Helladic. And in the Cyclades, it's the same. But here's where things get thorny because they don't exactly happen at the same time. Uh, the Cyclades are late to develop, and so they're going to be the last to change over to the new styles. Um, Crete seems to be ahead of the game, so Crete's gonna have really fascinating pottery, and the Cyclades are gonna be developing their own strange pottery 
called the Frying Pans. We'll talk about it. But the influence seems to go from the Minoans to the mainland and the Cyclades. So the Minoans are the first game in town. They're the high style, and so everybody's going to be copying them. And so you'll notice that there's a lag, that we can be into the Middle Minoan and the Middle Helladic, but we're still into the early Cycladic. So again, these times are relative. Uh, they don't exactly correspond. Just because you're Middle Minoan doesn't mean you're Middle Cycladic. It could be early Cycladic. It gets even more confusing as we go on because then the Helladic peoples start to dominate and they start spreading their influence and their unique pottery styles into other areas. So, and then you have to overlay all of this, the palace periods, when the first palaces, the second palaces, the third palaces were built, and then the period when they stopped building palaces called post-palatial. So if my dates look very iffy and very fudgy, and, you know, they push around a couple hundred years, that's why, because, you know, it depends on what book you're looking at. Everybody has their opinion, but nobody's really entirely certain. All right, so let's start in on the Cyclades, this group of islands here. So this group of islands here, they're really small, but people inhabited them uh, for the obvious reason is that they're easily defendable. Uh, they're kind of bound by uh, Andros in the north and Santorini or Thera in the south. Uh, the other islands, Chios and Rhodes and Lesbos, those are over to the east and they aren't part of the Cyclades. So the Cyclades is just this tiny group of islands. Keros is a very important island. A lot of the finds we're going to be looking at is from Keros. Uh, but these are rocky little islands that people made a, a living on. And they have a very unique kind of art. They have these Cycladic figurines. And these are found nowhere else in the world. The Cycladic figurines are grave goods. We always find them in graves. And they are almost always, not always, but almost always female which makes us think that they may be fertility symbols. When these were uncovered in the 19th century, they were really kind of uh, startling. This is the beginnings of modernist art, and modernists absolutely love these, and you can understand why. They look modern. They have abstract heads, blade-like noses, stylized figures and bodies. Uh, about the only thing that we can say for certain is they wanted us to know they're female. They have uh, a gesture towards breasts, and they also have... Um, an incised area in the vulva uh, and the female genitalia. So they definitely wanted us to know these were female. The largest are five feet tall, uh, but most are around the area of eight to 12 inches. And we call them fertility figurines because again, they are, again, you can tell they are interested in delineating the female genitalia. They often have a triangle and the triangle has a single line indicating the female genitalia. So they definitely wanted us to know they were female. Uh, and because of that, uh, we suspected that they may be fertility figurines. Uh, but then somebody started looking at the graves and they discovered that most of the graves are male graves. These appear to be males and appear to be elites, warriors, kings, rulers, some stuff like that. So maybe they're not fertility. Maybe they're some kind of goddess. I've mentioned it before, but if you go to the Middle Ages, the saint that is invoked the most for military victory is the Virgin Mary. She's an extraordinarily popular saint. You don't think of the Virgin Mary. Think of her as all loving and nice. You don't think of her as this badass who guarantees victory in battle. But that's the way she was seen in the Middle Ages. So who knows? Maybe we're imposing our very narrow gender uh, stereotypes onto another age. Maybe this is a warrior goddess. We don't know. But you have to admire... The, the very stylized renditions of the heads, the lips, the blade-like nose. So what can we say about these things? Well, they're definitely funerary objects meant to accompany the dead in the afterlife. And mostly female, although we do find a few males. And they're mostly standing fertility figurines. But we do find a few things like this lyre player who's playing a lyre, uh, an early harp. And they're actually more naturalistic in the early periods. Uh, they actually look a little bit more humanistic in the first periods and they get more abstract as time goes on. They were painted. There's traces of paint on them. But uh, none of that paint, uh, most of that paint doesn't survive. So while they're made out of limestone and marble today, they were really meant to be uh, very colorful. And some of the details like the eyes and other features were painted on. There is one other artifact that the uh, Cycladic people are famous for. 
and that is the so-called cycladic frying pan. These are these oblong objects. They often have, I guess you could call them a handle, but they're not really handles, these two nodes on one end. Sometimes they have one, sometimes they have three, but usually two. And you can tell why they call these things frying pans, because when you see them flip over, they look like frying pans. They have a lip around the outside. They have these, let me just do that again for you, they have a decorated back, and they have a kind of lip that looks like a frying pan. Well, the one thing we can tell you uh, certain about these is they're not frying pans. They're they are no evidence of any scorch marks on these things at all, and so we know they weren't used for cooking. And in fact, we don't know what they were used for. They are decorated on the back, but maybe that's the front. Some people have suggested these may have been lids to baskets. That could have worked. Other people have suggested these may have been mirrors, because if you hold on to those little tiny handles and put a little water in the opposite side and held it very still, you could see a reflection. Maybe. One thing that's been suggested is that they may be representations of the womb or of a uterus. They are vaguely uterus shaped, and in fact, if we look right there, there is that very characteristic incised triangle that indicates female genitalia over on the figurines. So that seems to make sense. So these are some kind of ritual or fertility object, except. If these are wombs, what is a ship doing in the middle of the womb? Uh, it's just kind of crazy. You can actually see the ship there, and uh, it actually has a fish off the prow. This design with the triangles and spirals usually means waves, so this is the ocean. Uh, I've heard of difficult pregnancies, but giving birth to a ship has got to be one of the worst. We really have no idea what's going on here. Obviously, some mythology or story that we're missing, and we just can't piece it together. Uh, so our best guess is some kind of ritual object. And let me in a, let you in on a secret. If you're an archaeologist or an anthropologist and you ever dig up something, you have no idea what it is, just call it a ritual object. No one will question you. Uh, that's the, the usual term for something we don't understand. So let's leave the Cyclades, and let's go down here to Crete. Crete is this oblong island down at the bottom of the Aegean. It's a very uh, fertile place. It's even today, it's known for uh, olive groves and uh, wheat fields. And the Minoans uh, civilization was centered on Crete. Uh, let's talk about the Minoans. They're centered on Crete and they're named for the mythical King Minos. Uh, King Minos lived on the island according to mythology. And we have no idea what these people called themselves. Uh, so we named them after King Minos. King Minos is, of course, very famous for the story of Theseus and the Minotaur. His wife gives birth to this monster that has the head of a bull and the body of a man, and he does what any loving parent does. He locks it in the basement, and once every seven years, he feeds it seven virgins and seven young men, until Theseus comes along, and he manages to persuade uh, the king's daughter, Ariadne, to give him the secret to killing the Minotaur, and he does. And what we'll notice is, I'm not suggesting that story is true by any means, but what we'll notice is there's an awful lot of bull imagery uh, around the island. We do know that they were literate, they had a writing system, but unfortunately we can't read it. And so it's something of a mystery to us. And the palace at Knossos uh, seems to indicate that these were vassal states that were ruled with by a, a centralized government, uh, some kind of feudal system where they gave tribute. So the story of Theseus and the Minotaur is disturbing on so many levels. Uh, if you really want to blow your mind, go figure out how the Minotaur is born. Uh, and if you really want to not blow your mind, don't go read it. Greek myth. It's lovely. And again, I'm not suggesting there were actually bullheaded monsters, but from the bull imagery that we find all over this island, it suggests that there's something going on. Uh, perhaps uh, Athens was a tribute state to Knossos and had to offer up uh, seven uh, maids and seven young men as a form of tribute. We'll talk more about that when we get to the Bull Leaper. The Minoans not have not one, but two styles of writing. Uh, the first style of writing is Minoan hieroglyphics, and here on the Phaestus disc, you can see that several of the 
symbols are repeating. So these are actually made with little wooden stamps. This is probably the first use of movable type in history. And you can see how this spirals out and the words are divided up by these sections. Unfortunately, nobody can read this, but there's about 80 symbols, 80 unique symbols. And that's actually kind of significant. If you know a little bit about linguistics, you know that if you're using an ideographic system, this is where each symbol stands for a single word or idea. It takes about 2,000 symbols to, to create a functioning language. And uh, you, know, you have to know about 2,000 unique symbols in Chinese to read an average Chinese newspaper, for example. But if you're using an alphabet, then each letter stands for a single sound, not a single idea. And alphabets, which were first invented by the Phoenicians, that's why we call it the phonetic system, they have about 20 to 30 symbols. But in between, there's a thing called a syllabary. And a syllabary, instead of having a letter or a symbol for each sound or each idea, you have a symbol for each syllable. And that is every consonant vowel combination. So you have a unique symbol for bay, a unique symbol for bow, a unique symbol for you know, B, and it goes on and on and on. And if you add that up, that takes about 80, 90 symbols to make that work. And so this is obviously some kind of syllabic form of language. They simplified the hieroglyphs, much like the Egyptians did, and started writing in another system. And we call this system Greek Linear A. But nobody can read it either. So these people did have names, they did have a history. They almost certainly didn't call themselves the Minoans, but whoever they were, we will never know. So if you've got an afternoon and, you know, looking for a tough puzzle, the Sudoku isn't doing it for you, give it a shot. Uh, you might crack it wide open. So Crete is dominated by a series of structures we call palaces. And they're palaces, but they're more ceremonial centers. You can see there's lots of them all over the place. The largest and probably the central palace is on the north coast, just in from the north coast at Knossos. And this would have been the legendary home of King Minos himself. This is the site today. You can see there's still um, groves and fields around it to this day. The palace at Knossos was the site of uh, King Minos. And of course, one of the parts of the story of Theseus and the Minotaur is that the Minotaur was hidden in a labyrinth, a maze underneath the palace. Well, if you look at this palace plan, it is very maze-like. You'll notice it has a lot of turns in it, and this is probably done for the purposes of defense. If you're somebody who lives here, you know how to get around the palace, so it's not a mystery to you, but to somebody who's attacking, every turn is a, another corner around which there might be some ambush. Well, it turns out that all over this palace and in various locations in the iconography and the art, we find labors. And these are labors. These are double-headed ceremonial axes made out of gold. Well, if you've ever played Minecraft, you know gold items aren't worth crap. Uh, you can't do a thing with them. So these are votive objects. These are, again, ritual objects, ceremonial objects. And uh, this is the root word of the word labyrinth. So I know I said labyrinth, uh, some of you immediately went to David Bowie, but no, what we're talking about here is these double-headed axes. So again, this is another piece of evidence of not suggesting the Minotaur was real, but there's some kernel of truth to what we're finding here. The site was excavated by Arthur Evans uh, between 1900 and 1914, and he reconstructed much of the site. And you can see some of those reconstructions here has these very unusual columns that look like they're upside down because they're whiter at the top than they're at the bottom. But we can do this because we have images of the architecture and art, and we also have little tomb models that show us what this would have looked like. So the reconstructions are fairly reliable, and they give a sense of what this would have been like. It would have been a palace full of open porches and porticos and atriums. Uh, one of the things he reconstructed here is the horns of consecration. We find these all over the site and all over their artwork. And these are sacred bull's horns uh, that would have been used in some ritual purpose. So let's take a look at the Palace of Knossos because it's very representative of what these palaces would have been like all over Crete. 
Uh, these palace complexes all have the same features, and they're all built around a large central courtyard, which we believe is a ceremonial center, a place of uh, ritual performance. Uh, they also have these long storage rooms we call magazines, which is an indication that this is some kind of feudal society, that uh, the peasants or the serfs would bring in food to the main location, and then it would be distributed from there. And so this is a place to bring either tribute to the king, uh, or tribute from vassals, or tribute from serfs. Then it has a royal residence. Makes sense. We've got a place to live. Uh, but also a major function of it is that it has all of these cultic sites. These are rooms that are obviously made for some religious purpose, shrines, uh, cultic spaces. These are their lustral basins, which are places that you could wash and purify yourself. You'll notice that there is no obvious walls or fortifications. That's because they didn't need it. Uh, the truth is, Crete is kind of like a gigantic, uh, you know, aircraft carrier. It's surrounded by water on all sides, so it's naturally defended. Uh, they were very able seamen, and so their navy and the ocean was their defense. But even if somebody got this far, it would be very hard to take a building like this because of all of the corners, all of the little hidey holes. You'll notice that there's a large number of left turns in the building, and that's not an accident. That when you get into the building, there are all these left-hand turns. And that's not an accident because if you're holding a shield, you'll most people are right-handed, so you hold the shield in the left hand, you hold the spear or your sword in the, in the right, and as you turn that corner, the shield is into the corner, that leaves your right side exposed, <coughs> you get a ambush, a, a hatchet, or a, a spear right in the neck. So that maze-like structure is probably intentional. When we look at reconstructions of this, it's just beautiful. There's over six different levels, and some of the buildings would have been three and four stories high huge porticos. Of course, it's a hot country, so you need places for shade and places to pull air. You'll notice that there are lots of open atriums, and at the bottom of these atriums are going to be pools of water, so this will pull the hot air in and produce evaporative cooling, pull the cooler air into the building and pull the hot air out. Um, and all of this built around a courtyard. Here it is from the other side. You notice that it doesn't have any clear, obvious approach. Uh, there is a kind of main approach on one side, but you kind of have to go through a lot of labyrinth to, to get there. In the main courtyard, you would have had uh, a pillar shrine with the horns of consecration here, uh, and then places and porticos where people could watch events, uh, porches, and large uh, stairs. The stairs would have acted as seats for uh, watching festivities, and it seems that there was a lot of festivities to watch. Now, there's not much to talk about the magazines. They're long, and they were filled with these pithoi. Pithoi are stone jars that are very good storage. They keep things nice and cool and are airtight, and they would have been sealed up. So it's obvious this is a major area of redistribution of uh, foodstuffs and wealth. Some of the more interesting rooms is the so-called throne room, which one thing we can say about it is it's probably not a throne room. It probably is a religious site. So it is built around a stairwell, which is really remarkable. At the bottom of the stairwell is one of these lustral basins. So this is a place where you could wash. So again, you have air that gets pulled in over the water and goes out the stairwell, creating evaporative cooling, but this is also a place where you could be ceremonially, ceremonially cleansed. And in the middle of the stairway, as we see in this animation, is a throne room. And the throne room is interesting because it you don't approach the throne room from the front like we think of a throne room, you instead approach it from the side. It has a single throne carved out of a single block of gypsum, and it's surrounded on all sides by griffins. Griffins are uh, animals that have the bodies of lions and the heads of eagles, and they represent a divine presence. They're guardian figures. So they're just like the Sphinx in that way. So notice also there's another basin in front of the throne here. Here's the throne here. Here's another view of it this way. And so this was obviously used for some kind of ritual washing. This is some kind of temple, and the throne is probably not reserved for a king, but for some kind of priest or priestesses. 
even if it is reserved for the king, it's likely that the king was, this was a religious functional space. You notice that they're surrounded by lilies. One of the things that's really interesting about uh, Minoan art and Aegean art is the use of fresco, and the frescoes are very lively, very dynamic and organic. And you can see that when we go to the residence on the opposite side of the courtyard. So if we go to the opposite side of the courtyard, we have a series of halls. These are called the King's Room and the King Queen's Room, but those are just romantic names that were given by Arthur Evans. We have no idea who actually lived in these places or what their titles were. When we get to the Queen's Megaron or the Queen's Room, we see that it's beautifully decorated. It's got a wonderful portico and it's also got a fresco. The fresco in this case, the fresco in this case is really unusual in the sense that usually the frescoes in the art that we've seen reinforce a central image. Let me back up to the throne room and, and, and explain what I mean by that. Uh, you'll notice how these griffins are symmetrically placed either side of the throne. That gives you a clear indication that whoever's sitting in that throne is the important person. And notice that they are symmetrical side to side. This is what we might call a heraldic structure. Heraldry is crests, symbols that denote kingship or nobility, but it's also a heratic structure. A heratic structure means priestly. It means a religious structure. Notice how it has registers and it's organized in that way. So this is all meant to indicate who is the most important person or what's the most important function of that room. But we get outside of there and we don't see that. Instead, what we see is a beautiful fresco of dolphins gambling about in the surf. You can see this net-like pattern here that represents the waves. It's very nice. It's very nice. If you've ever seen like uh, reflections off the surface of a pool on a ceiling, it looks just like this. Uh, but notice that there are sea plants on all sides, so we're actually supposed to imagine this like we're looking down into a pool and seeing these uh, dolphins. There's no hieroglyphics, <laughs> there's no registers, there's no symmetry. Think about Egyptian art. Everything is so structured in Egyptian art so you know exactly what's going on. Uh, there's very important gesture, etc. But there, none of that exists in uh, Minoan art. It's instead very free-forming, uh, free-flowing and organic. It has no hieratic or heraldic structure most of the time. And it's just meant to be enjoyed. It's probably the, one of the earliest examples then of art for art's sake. And the reason this doesn't have any hieroglyphs or anything else is think about it. Uh, do you need hieroglyphs explaining your wallpaper? No, you know, your wallpaper is there to decorate the room. And that's probably what this is there to do. There's a few other frescoes that are of interest. This has a relief to it can see that it's modeled in low relief and this is obviously some kind of priest or king. Uh, we're not entirely certain but they are holding a rope. Whatever they were holding the rope to is long since gone but we assume it was a bull uh, being led to sacrifice. And there's some commonalities here with uh, Egyptian art. He is in the profile but his hips aren't quite forward enough and his eye is not quite a frontal eye. A frontal eye looks like this. And a profile eye looks like this. And this is a strange kind of halfway in between the two. And we'll see more of that as we go on. Uh, this is one of the more famous frescoes recovered at the site. This is the Toreador, or Bullfighter fresco, but it's actually more accurately called uh, Bull Leapers. And this is again where we might have a kernel of truth to the story of Theseus. So the story of Theseus is that uh, Knossos demanded tribute from Athens and every seven years Athens had to send, send seven young women and seven young men uh, to be fed to the bull monster, the Minotaur. And maybe they weren't being fed to a, a minotaur, a bull-headed monster. Maybe they were being fed to an actual bull. Maybe not being fed, or they were forced to fight a, a bull. So this is, first of all, just dynamically, there's nothing like this in Egyptian art. We have this really organic figures. They're clearly in motion. The bull is leaping itself off the ground. It is in full gallop. So stylistically, this is, is really quite amazing. It's very organic, very free-flowing. 
Well, it takes a little bit to explain what's going on here. We believe that this was a ritual that was performed in the uh, central courtyard. Uh, a wild bull would be set loose, and men and women, and yes, these are men and women, men are usually shown dark-skinned because they work outside, women are supposed to work inside, so they have fair skin, but these clearly have breasts, so these are women. So these are men and women who both do this. And the idea is that, you know, wild bull is going to be angry. Uh, you get the wild bull to charge at you, and as the wild bull charges at you, you have a very difficult choice. Uh, you can either flee, uh, which would defeat the purpose of the ritual, or uh, you can try to dodge the bull's horns. Uh, now, the only way to do this is to grab onto the bull's horns. So rather than being gored alive, you've got to grab the horns. One's got to imagine this is an extraordinarily difficult thing to do. Uh, if you're holding onto the bull's horns, this is a very, very difficult uh, place to be. Uh, you can understand the metaphor. Uh, because the bull is going to want to trample you, and if you cling to the horns, its natural instinct is going to be to rear and buck its head back to throw you off. So here's how we think this works. You get the bull to charge you. You somehow miraculously avoid being gored or trampled and hold on to the horns. When the bull rears its head, you use that energy and momentum to fling yourself over the back of the bull, do a handspring off the back of the bull, and then land delicately on your toesies here, where I'm sure the whole crowd would cheer. One has to imagine this wasn't achieved successfully all that often. <laughs> and maybe that's what was happening. Maybe they were getting uh, vassal states to send tribute in the form of young men or young women to perform this ritual. What was this ritual about? No one really knows. Bulls are most commonly associated with solar imagery. Uh, it's a bull that's imagined to carry the uh, sun across the sky in a lot of Near Eastern uh, mythology. So maybe this was some kind of renewal, that passing over the bull is like the sun passing uh, through the sky. And if this wasn't performed uh, adequately, then maybe this was feared that you would have uh, poor harvests or uh, not a good growing season. There is another fresco <clears throat> which seems to be uh, the audience watching this event called the Grandstand Fresco. When we look at it, here's it's very hard to see in the original, but here in the uh, reconstruction you can see that there's this pillar shrine right in the center and there's also these monumental staircases right here and this seems to be these uh, shrines and monumental staircases in the um, actual courtyard. So there's a one-to-one -one correlation between those. And that kind of makes sense. So these are the people who are watching this ceremony. You can see that there are both men and women. You have this group of women here, but here are men, and most of them are just heads. Uh, there are some prominent women here on either side, who are given the full body treatment, but we'll talk about them in a bit. So you can imagine people sitting along the eaves of this building watching this kind of event. So bull imagery is very, very common everywhere you look. Some of the things we find are at the site are these uh, rita. Uh, a riton is a vessel. Uh, usually it means a drinking vessel, uh, but these were never meant to be uh, you know, you don't, you don't remember to drink from these. Uh, these were ceremonial vessels, and they are hollow on the inside, so they can hold liquid. One thing that's interesting about these, this one is beautifully carved out of stone, and again, it's hollow on the inside, so it's really quite skilled. But you can see that this has been reconstructed, that it's got all these little cracks in it, right in the forehead. So this was had, they had to put this back together. When they found this, this was smashed. Now, for the longest time, they thought these things were smashed accidentally. They just, you know, things get buried in a ruin and they get smashed. Happens all the time. Uh, but they discovered that every single one of these they found was smashed right between the, the uh, eyes and the forehead. That means it was intentionally smashed. It was originally smashed with a hammer. 
And that means this is probably some kind of simulacra. A simulacra is a proxy. It's a stand-in for a sacrificial victim. So this thing may have been filled with wine, may have been filled with blood. We don't know. But you can imagine it being struck with a hammer and then all the liquid pouring out. It must have been quite, you know, uh, you know uh, emphatic and really kind of a spectacle. And we do find bull's heads, including another similar uh, bull's head right on from Mycenae. So we know that um, this idea, this bull's head imagery gets copied into the mainland. We can see this bullhead imagery elsewhere at the sarcophagus. This is the Aya Triada sarcophagus. It comes from the Aya Triada site, which is over on the far west end of the island of Crete. But uh, we call this a sarcophagus, but it's probably an ossuary meant to hold just the bones or the ashes of the deceased. And on the side, it has a fresco, and the fresco depicts a sacrifice scene. Uh, on the one side, we have this little kind of guy You'll notice he has no arms or legs, so he's probably meant to represent a statue of the deceased, and he's seated in front of what looks like the door to a tomb. There is a tree in front of him and some steps, and so people are bringing offerings this direction. And two of the people that are bringing offerings this direction are carrying little miniature bulls. Now, these aren't little kind of Dotson-sized, uh, you know, bovines. Although they do exist. I discovered there are actually miniature cows. They're, they're the size of like St. Bernard's. They're big, but they're much smaller than actual cows. They're so cute. I went to a petting zoo and saw them. But no, these aren't uh, miniature cows. These are obviously meant to be ceremonial vessels. And so these are ceremonial vessels that are being given to the spirit or the idol representing this deceased ancestor. If we go over to the other side of the Iotriotis sarcophagus, the other side of the frieze, we'll see two women who are uh, presiding over uh, some ritual libations. They are pouring liquid into a pithoi. Notice that we have our labbers. I know they look like golden bats, but these are actually labbers, these double-headed axes, these symbolic axes. And we have a man playing music because, hey, if you're going to have a sacrifice, you've got to have music. But one thing I want you to notice about this is um, that the women are the ones who are officiating. The men are carrying things, but it's the women who seem to be in charge. Now, this has another side, and on the other side of the Aya Triata sarcophagus, uh, we actually do have uh, an actual bull. You can see the bull is trussed up, and he's going to be sacrificed. And behind him is another musician. This guy is playing a double flute. Uh, but, again, the men are in subservient roles. They are doing, uh, playing the music or carrying objects. The women who are officiating, uh, the people who are officiating at the altars are women. So we see a woman here, and we have this other woman here who is officiating at the altar. And then we see at the altar, we see another double-headed golden axe. We also see offerings that are being made, and we see a shrine, and in the shrine we have horns of consecration. So let's go back and take a look at those women at the Grandstown fresco. This is something that is very, very important to Minoan civilization, but also very important to the Aegean, is these women. We see these women everywhere, and they're always very elaborately dressed. They have these large flounced skirts with multiple layers and complex textiles. They have these elaborate hairstyles. Uh, they have jewelry in abundance. And then they have these uh, tight-fitting jerkins or jackets that rather bizarrely leave the, uh, the breasts exposed. We don't know who these women are, but we do know that they are they function in Minoan and Aegean religion, and they're very, very important. We see more of these women than virtually anything else. Now, for a long time, that made people think this was a matriarchal society. But when we get to the mainland, we actually do have written records, and all of the records of like deeds and titles and holdings are male. And so that suggests that, no, it's not a matriarchal society, but that these women uh, serve a priestly function. They are priestesses or, or sibyls or prophetesses, we're not entirely certain.
We have sculptures out of them out of the first palace period. These are sculptures made out of faience. Faience is this wonderful glassy-like ceramic material. Uh, and here again, you can see them. Uh, snakes are often symbols of fertility. So maybe these are fertility figures, but they have flounce skirts, elaborate jewelry, hairstyles, headdresses, and of course, open bodices, which is kind of unusual, but there they are. So that seems to emphasize the fertility aspect of it. We also see these women in finds all over the region. These are signet rings. These are large gold rings that would be stamped into wax or clay to act as a kind of seal or signature. So these are carved into gold, and we see them here. These actually come from shaft graves in, um, uh, in Mycenae and in the mainland. So here we have again these elaborate women. They're incredibly elaborate skirts. They're open bodices. One of the women is lying on what appears to be an altar. Uh, another woman here is presiding, and then we have a man here who is kneeling at an altar, or perhaps he's not kneeling, perhaps he's bound up to a tree at the altar, indicating, and the way his legs are spread apart suggests that he's not kneeling, that he's kind of hanging there. You know, maybe he's a sacrificial victim. It's kind of strange. Here again, you see another one of these. We have double-headed axe. Uh, we have these women in their elaborate skirts, and another woman who is holding uh, what appear to be lilies, which seem to be sacred. She's under a tree. Trees seem to be very important. Then we have a couple of smaller figures, perhaps children or attendants as well. The last thing we'll talk about the Minoans is their pottery. They're just famous for their pottery. If you really want to get into the pottery, you definitely ought to uh, read the book uh, Minoan Pottery, uh, written by Philip Betancourt, who literally wrote the book on the subject. Uh, Minoan pottery is amazing because usually pottery, much like walls or other surfaces, is structured and broken into registers and meant to tell a narrative or a story, but not Minoan pottery. Minoans recognize that a pot is a very organic shape, and in that organic shape it's very hard to tell a straightforward story, so instead it was covered with a series of undulating and repeating patterns. There is an all-over surface decoration that covers the entire pot. It's really remarkable. And you can see this even as they change styles and they do start doing more narrative themes or more representational themes. I shouldn't say narrative. Narrative means storytelling. Representation just as representation of figures. Uh, they still have this all over sense of decoration, this organic sense of decoration. Marine wear uh, has themes from the ocean. And it doesn't just have octopuses, it has fish and all kinds of things from the oceans, but octopuses are popular. And so here you see the tentacles of the octopus spread out over the surface of the vase, covering every section, little bits of seaweed are in between, so that no matter which way you look at this vase, it has uh, a compelling decorative surface. It's really quite marvelous. When we see Mycenaean pottery, we'll see it's completely different. So that brings us to the mainland, and mostly this is going to be uh, the Peloponnese, but a little bit in uh, the Attican uh, Peninsula. So just to orient you, this is where modern-day Athens is. Uh, this is Boeotia. This is Attica out here. Uh, Corinth is right on the Isthmus here. And this section here we call the Argolid. Um, and this is where Mycenae is. But there's many of these sites up here. Uh, Pelos is a site we'll take a look at. Tiryns is a site we'll take a look at. We'll also see some things from Bafeo, which are down here in the lower Peloponnese. And this is the habitation of where the Mycenaeans, or the Helladic peoples, lived. And the one thing we know about these is these people are definitely Greeks. We don't know if the Minoans are Greek or not. Maybe they're Greek, maybe they're not. Heck, we don't even know if they're Indo-European. It might be uh, Semitic or Near Eastern peoples from the Eastern Mediterranean, like Phoenicians. Uh, we can't read their language, and, and all the studies on their uh, genetics have kind of been inconclusive. Uh, but these people are Greek, and when they first arrived, they arrived later than the Minoans, and it's obvious that they're dependent on the Minoans for a lot of their culture. Uh, they actually adopt Greek Linear A, uh, and Greek Linear A is used by both the Minoans and the mainland peoples. But pretty soon, they invent their own writing form. Uh, which is called Greek Linear B. 
Now, Greek Linear A has never been translated, but Greek Linear B has been translated, and it is a syllabic form of Greek. And it's only used by the Mycenaeans, and it was deciphered uh, in 1951 by a guy named Bastris, who wasn't even an archaeologist or a linguist, so it's really kind of an amazing achievement that he pulled it off. Uh, but it opened up a whole world to us and gave us a much greater understanding of who these people are. So we call them the Mycenaeans because of Mycenae. Mycenae is the legendary city of Agamemnon, and so that seems appropriate. Mycenae definitely seems to be their capital city, but whether they called themselves Mycenaeans or not, uh, well, actually, we can say that. They didn't call themselves Mycenaeans. They called themselves Greeks. Um, but, of course, Greeks didn't call themselves Greeks. They called themselves Hellenikoi. Uh, the Greek word for Greek is Hellen, or... Uh, we call them Greeks because when the Romans first encountered Greeks, they asked, where are you from? And the Greeks uh, the said, oh, we are from Grekoi, and that was the city they were from, not the nation they were from. And so ever since then, uh, Romans called everybody who came from that Greek, the same way that, you know, it's a misnomer, same way we call Indians Indians, even though they're not from India, uh, they're, they're from the West Indies. So it's just a just a tip, you know, if you ever, uh, you know, get encounter an alien species and they ask, who are you? Uh, say humans or Terrans. Uh, don't say Utahns or all humans will be known as uh, Utahns from that time onward. And they are definitely Greek and they're very militaristic. They build massive fortifications. We call these fortifications Cyclopean because they're so massive. People thought they were built by giant cyclopses. Uh, and they have a very militaristic rule. At the top of the food chain, uh, the hierarchy, is a thing called a Wanox, and the Wanox is a warlord god-king. It's a fantastic title, and he definitely seems to be semi-divine, much in the same way that the Near Eastern uh, kings are semi-divine. And while all of the individual city-states are more or less under their own rule, if he calls them to war, if he calls them to battle, they have to answer. He has a second in command called Elawagetos, uh, who's kind of like his major domo, who goes out and uh, makes orders and uh, controls things, uh, his executive officer. And then underneath that, we have a whole bunch of smaller rulers who are vassals. And the word used here to describe these vassals are, is basileos. And basileos is a Greek word. It's the Greek word for king today. But it obviously didn't mean king back then. What's interesting is uh, all of Bronze Age civilization collapses, and when it collapses, those two upper titles, Wanox and Lawagetos, they disappear from Greek. They're never used again. But Basileus preserves. So it sounds like once the warlord god king disappeared, uh, the Basileus, the kings, took over. Uh, but they have this very strong militaristic society, which we'll see. Their central capital is in Mycenae. Uh, it was excavated by Heinrich Schliemann and, uh, in 1879. Now, the funny thing is, the city had never been buried. It had always been known. I mean, uh, anciently the Greeks said, oh, that's Mycenae, that's the site of, of the great city of Agamemnon, this great hero from Greek mythology in the Iliad. Uh, but no one actually believed it. Uh, in the 19th century, the belief was, eh, that's all fairy tales, none of that is actually true. Uh, and no one ever bothered to excavate it. So you got to give Heinrich Schliemann credit. You know, he, he's kind of an interesting character. He, was, he made his own fortune and then decided to spend the rest of his life uh, uh, doing archaeology. And he's one of the founders of archaeology. So he went and excavated this. He excavated Troy. And he found a boatload of stuff. So here you can see the modern city. Uh, this is what's left. At the top is a citadel. And then here is Grave Circle A. And then the Lion Gate would be located right there. You can see how massive the fortification walls are. Look at how thick that thing is. It's, it's plenty thick. Uh, here's a reconstruction of what this looked like. And it's not laid out like the palaces of Knossos at all. It has a lot of the same similar features in architecture, but it fits the landscape. And the biggest feature is that it's this mammoth wall. And the walls truly are colossal. So large, again, that people thought they were made by giants or cyclopses. Here you can see a detail from the walls of Tyran. Here's a person for scale, a small person for scale, but 
uh, relatively, you know, you can see how gigantic those boulders are. Here is the plan of the fortress at Tiryns, and you can see just how thick those walls actually are. Uh, just, just look at them. Also, it shows how militar, uh, military, how militarily minded these people were. This is the gate right here, and so if you were to get into the citadel here, you would have to first go through this gate, cross this gate, cross this gate, again, uh, take a right turn here into another gate. All the while, people standing up on these walls and these buildings could rain down slings, arrows, spears, rocks, dead cats, whatever they wanted. Uh, this is essentially the human equivalent of a, of a blender, of a Cuisinart, and going through it would have been a very unpleasant experience. You can see that over here at the main gate to Mycenae. It has this spur out here to defend the gate. Uh, the gate would have been this massive 10-foot uh, tall wooden door that filled this space and has these massive blocks of stone. The gate itself is surmounted by a huge lintel, and then to relieve the space over the lintel, uh, they built these uh, corbelled arches. You can see how each one of these juts out a little further. And then they filled the space with a thin stone here. And this stone, again, it has more of this heraldic kind of structure. It has this symmetrical structure where you have a column down the center and then you have a lion on either side. So it's symmetrical side to side. Uh, this would have been the emblem of the city. Well, just inside the city gate, we have Grave Circle A. And Grave Circle A was a burial ground for their kings and their elites. It's surrounded by a low wall, and the low wall is made up of slabs of stone. There's two rows of these slabs. You can see one row there and one there. And then the interior would have been filled with rubble. It's broken down now. Uh, it would have looked something like this. And then inside there would have been burials, and the burials would have had tombstones or stelae placed over them. This is the location of the shaft graves. This is an extraordinarily rich burial grounds. This is where uh, Heinrich Schliemann found most of the gold and artifacts he uncovered. Just incredible stuff. Now he thought he was digging into a burial ground that came from the age of the Homeric uh, epics. The Homeric epics, of course, the, uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey, the stories of the Trojan War and the stories of the wanderings of uh, Odysseus. Uh, but these actually come from about 400, 500 years before that time period. So he's a little bit off in his dating and his method, but it was early yet. Uh, he hadn't yet kind of solidified a lot of things in archaeology. So let's take a look at the stelae. The stelae are actually relatively simple. They're just upright blocks of stone. Uh, this one has a chariot scene on it. The chariot has spirals underneath the hooves of the horse. So perhaps this is Poseidon riding on the ocean. We don't know. There's no inscriptions, but they would have been painted, and otherwise they're just sculpted in this row, low relief. Underneath these stelae were shaft graves, and the graves themselves are remarkably humble. There's no coffins, no tombs, no uh, big edifices. Uh, these are unlike the, the very fancy tombs of the Egyptians. Uh, and instead, it's just a, a humble grave where the person was laid on their side uh, in the fetal position. Here you can see a photograph of, of one of these shaft graves. And these would have been the shaft graves of the warriors and the rulers of the city. But what makes them special is they're just loaded with an enormous amount of luxury grave goods, and I do mean luxury, an incredible amount of gold in dazzling array. So we have pins for cloaks, pins made out of crystal and gold, drinking cups, jewelry, uh, crowns, uh, you know, plaques, golden vessels, uh, jewelry in endless profusion, rosettes and volutes and ducks and dragonflies. Uh, here's a set of um, earrings. Uh, these are basket earrings and they have these beautiful 
foliate uh, motifs. Another thing we find are these plaques. You'll notice that these plaques have little holes in them, and that's so they could be sewn onto shrouds. Uh, literally thousands of these things were found, so they would have been sewn onto shrouds that would have covered the deceased. When we look at the iconography, you can see that we have octopuses, we have bull's heads with labbers, double-headed axes, and we have pillar shrines. Uh, and these are all themes that come from the Minoan world. And so it seems that they are copying uh, the Minoan artistic expressions. And that makes sense. Remember, the Mycenaeans are late on the scene. They're the ones that have arrived later. And when they arrive, the Minoans are already this big civilization on the island of Crete. So they're going to copy the big civilization in the region because they're very prestigious and have a lot of influence. This is what we call the Versailles effect. Louis XIV in the 17th century built this massive palace at Versailles, and he gathered all the artists and courtiers and poets, etc., to them. He created this incredible culture, and so pretty soon all of the royal households of Europe were emulating um, Louis XIV because he had this very high style. So we'll see these plaques and gold relief in abundance. Uh, these were wrapped around them and their clothes. You can see how many of these plaques were. They just must have been dazzling. And one of the other things that we have are these golden death masks. This uh, mask was wrapped around the face of the deceased. I know that when you look at it today, these ears stick out like Alfred E. Newman or Will Smith, but nope. Uh, you have to realize that's a bit of a distortion. Uh, this was actually bent back around the face, and when they pulled it off, it was so fragile they didn't want to bend it back, so they just left it the way it is. So this is a little bit of a distortion of how it's supposed to look. Uh, it should have, probably would have looked a little bit more naturalistic than this. But this is the same idea as the Golden Mask of Tutankhamun. It's there to protect the face and to um, you know, give it adamantine flesh, flesh that will last into the ages. Stylistically, it's very abstract. Uh, the ears, you can see, are, are very stylized, as are the eyes. Um, but it is unique. There's several of these gold masks that exist, and each one of them is unique, and that suggests that even though this is very stylized and abstract, they probably should be considered as portraits. Uh, some are very finely crafted, such as this one. Others just look like they you know, crammed aluminum foil on top of the face like a bunch of old leftovers, but there you go. <laughs> but uh, definitely, uh, you know, they're unique enough that it's it's a way of seeing that uh, uh, they definitely wanted to preserve something of the individual. And of course, the other thing we find in these are weapons. These are warriors, mostly. There are some women, but there's mostly men and we see a wide arrange, arrange, uh, uh, array of swords. Uh, just an incredible display of swords and weapons uh, and spears. Uh, these are all bronze. This is before the Iron Age, but you can see that they had pommels carved out of ivory, uh, hilts decorated in gold. Uh, these bronze swords were just amazing. They were wicked sharp and very strong. You can see the central rib here, but it's the hilts that really steal the show. Here you have two lions uh, turning to face each other, and then a handle that's completely covered in these beautiful spiral motifs. Outside of the Anglo-Saxon period, I think these are the most beautiful swords in the world. Uh, they're just dazzling, and it tells you how much this was a warrior culture. Beautiful inlay. This, the blade, is actually inlaid with silver lilies. And you can see the lily motif continuing on the handle. Some of the shaft graves have inlaid blades, and these are just exquisite. They're inlaid in gold and silver and niello. Niello is a alloy made out of uh, silver and uh, sulfur, and it's a shiny black. So here you can see uh, the silver, the gold, and then the black here is niello. And this is a nilotic scene. A nilotic scene is a river, so you can see a river going through it, and notice there are papyri uh, plants. And this looks very much like an Egyptian cat. So we see influence of Egyptian art as well. But some of these are purely Mycenaean. Uh, Mycenaeans loved warlike imagery. 
and hunting, and so you'll see lions being hunted. I love how the artist here has very cleverly made the lions here fleeing away. This one's looking back like, you know, come on, let's go. And as they're running and galloping, they fit into the narrower sections of the blade. But over in the wider sections of the blade, we have the upright standing humans. This poor guy is getting mauled by this lion, but these other people are fighting back. You'll notice they have these figure eight shaped shields and these shields have ox hides, spotted ox hides on them. This is a, a clear marker of, of Mycenaean culture. We never see these anyplace else. We also see signet rings in abundance. Uh, this is a signet ring that came from Mycenae. This shows uh, them hunting uh, a deer uh, using a chariot. Uh, but we also see bull leapers. This is the Theseus ring, and this is a signet ring that came from a shaft grave in the Plaka district which is just below the Acropolis in Athens. This is the oldest uh, section of Athens. And here we have a bull leaper, much like we would see in Knossos. Notice that the bull has incredible anatomy. This is a tiny little ring. It's just a couple inches across, and yet uh, all this beautiful carved anatomy. We also find cups. Uh, these are the Vafio cups. These were found in Vafio in another shaft grave. So there's shaft graves all over the Peloponnese. And in this case, we have two cups. One of them is known as the peaceful cup and one is the more uh, militant cup. On one of the cups, we see uh, somebody trying to capture a bull by catching it forcibly in a net. And unfortunately, he's getting uh, the bad side of the bull. You can see that he's getting trampled under the horns. This poor guy is getting trampled over here. So these two guys are getting uh, charged. Over here, this guy had a better idea. Uh, he snuck up behind the bull and tied its ankles together uh, while he distracted it with a cow. So if you unroll these cups, here's drawings of the cups. You can see how this has charging bulls and beautiful naturalistically rendered bulls the bulls are actually more realistic than the humans in a way and over here he just you know just release a cow to tempt the bull to come in and we'll just tie it up so beautiful stuff so an enormous amount of wealth was in this society and uh, they're still finding shaft graves in 2015 uh, the husband and wife uh, team of archaeologists jack davis and sharon stalker found uh, a tomb quite by accident. Uh, they had a, uh, an archaeological license to dig at Pylos, and they were supposed to dig up by the palace, but they ran into bureaucracy, and uh, the Department of Antiquities in Greece wouldn't let them dig there, but they did allow them to dig in this uh, olive grove a little further up the slope, and they're like, ah, oh, darn it. Uh, you know, kick the dirt because they didn't get to dig where they wanted to. And just by pure dumb luck, they stumbled upon one of the richest shaft graves that's ever been found, full of weapons and, and gold. So this is located down here in Pylos, uh, right there on the tail end of the Peloponnese. And it was a shaft grave. In this case, there was an actual coffin. It was made out of wood. It was disintegrated, but they could tell that it was there. And again, just a wealth of objects, bronze and gold, uh, bronze daggers with golden hilts, huge gold signet rings. And again, uh, the gold signet rings show our fabulous women dressed up to the nines in jewelry, covered in, uh, you know, fabulous skirts uh, surrounding a central shrine. The most amazing object, though, is this, this warrior gem. Now, this is intaglio. So this is the same thing as uh, these, you know, gigantic signet rings. But instead of being carved in gold, which is relatively soft and easy to carve, this is carved in chalcedony, which is this very hard, semi-precious gemstone. Can't even imagine what it must have taken to carve this in this detail. We have three warriors. One warrior is fallen and his uh, sheath and his sword are fallen by his side. You get this wonderful view of the anatomy of his back here. Uh, and this other one is avenging his fallen foe, or maybe this is another person he's killed, who knows. And he's reaching up over the shield to stab this guy in the neck. You really have to see the detail of this to appreciate it. Um, this, this is really remarkable stuff. You can't even really see the detail until you get to a drawing of it. And look at how good the anatomy looks on so much of this. Uh, all the articulated muscles on the back, the ribs, uh, this guy's 
um, you know, triceps and biceps. It's really remarkable. Well, elsewhere at Mycenae, there are a few large tombs that come from the third palace of the later palace period, and the biggest of these is the treasury of Atreus. <clears throat> the treasury of Atreus is a beehive tomb. That means it's kind of shaped like a beehive. It's built into a mound of earth. It has a dromos, or a kind of entryway, and it's all supported by a corbelled dome. The entryway has a massive lintel. This almost certainly would have been covered in stucco and decoration, much like you see over here, but all of that is now gone. This stone is the largest single monolith ever moved in antiquity on the continent of Europe. There are bigger ones in uh, the Middle East and in uh, Egypt, but in Europe it's the biggest single stone ever moved, uh, probably weighing over 200 and... 20 tons. Here you can see why it's so big. It extends all the way back here. It's massive lintel stone. And then all of this goes up to a corbelled dome that eventually comes to a point. Uh, nothing much was found in this tomb. It was pillaged in antiquity, but we can imagine that, you know, if the shaft graves were as rich as they were, this must have really been um, decked out. When we look at Mycenaean ceramics, um, I'll be honest, it's not as neat and interesting as the Minoan stuff. The Minoan stuff, from a design perspective, is much uh, much more thought out, much more organic as an all-over surface decoration. Instead, the Mycenaean stuff is going to be divided into registers, and they are going to have narrative art, like these warriors with their half-moon shields marching. Other ceramic things that we find are Mycenaean figurines, things like these little... Uh, figures. These are the counterparts to the Minoan women. Uh, they obviously want us to know they're women. They have gestural breasts, but they have very simplified heads and their faces are just made by pinching a, a kind of ridge-like nose and painting an eye on either side. They're very abstract. When we look at Mycenaean architecture, Mycenaean architecture has a number of unique features. Not only do they have the fortifications, but they also have this thing called a megaron. This one is probably the best preserved. This comes from the palace at Nestor at Pylos, and it has a central section with a porch and an anteroom. Uh, it is a throne room, and it has an axial orientation. We don't see a lot of that. An axial orientation means everything lines up in one axis. It has a central hearth, uh, and there are four columns that support the roof. And then the throne is actually off to the side, indicating that you can't just walk in. You'd think the throne would be on the uh, opposite of the entrance. That's the way throne rooms are today. Uh, but they don't want you to be able to see the king unless you are invited to him. That suggests the king is somehow sacred. Here is a view of the base. There you can see the central hearth and the bases for the columns. But this is what it would have looked like. Every square inch of this was covered in fresco. So it must have just been a, a marvelous palace. You can see that he is seated uh, between griffins and lions, indicating his uh, divine or semi-divine status. Elsewhere, all over the Megaron and in the Palace of Pylos, we find other frescoes, including frescoes of women. And it's the same women we've been seeing again and again and again. Uh, they have these open bodices, these tight jackets, flounced skirts, elaborate hairstyles, rich jewelry. And this really brings the question to who these women are. Is this evidence of conquest? Did they conquer the Minoans and bring these women as tribute? Or is this evidence of a common culture? And there's many different arguments you could make. For one, uh, the women are clearly the same women, but stylistically, they're much simpler. Uh, they look flatter, stiffer. They're not as organic or as free-flowing. Uh, so maybe these were women who were brought from Minoan conquests as tribute, or maybe they represent some kind of religious order, a kind of pan-cultural phenomenon that they were, these women were recognized as oracles and sibyls and priestesses. We see processions of these women carrying boxes and lilies and other sacred artifacts. Uh, we also see them in various other scenes. Well, that will bring us finally to the last place we're going to discuss, and that is uh, Santorini Thera. So just to remind you, this is Crete, this is the Cyclades, the Peloponnese, Attica, etc. 
And right here at the very south tail end of the Cyclades is the island of Thera, or Santorini. Again, this used to be controlled by the Italians, so it was given the name Santorini. And even the Greeks of the day there still refer to it as Santorini. Uh, but when Greek gained its independence, they thought, well, it, it should have a, a proper Greek name. So they renamed the island Thera. Uh, it's located right here. Another map, just so you know where it's at. And the thing that's so fascinating about Thera is Thera is a volcano. Uh, it is a massive, this is the caldera. You can see this better. So this is the rim of an active volcano. Uh, and the city is absolutely beautiful, but the city is perched on the edge of this volcano. Uh, and the lagoon is, uh, is in the center, is the caldera of the volcano. Uh, and it's still active. There was an eruption as recently as 1941. It uh, frequently has earthquakes. And so there's been many explosions and volcanic eruptions here over the centuries. But somewhere around the year 1600, uh, there was a massive explosion, an absolutely gargantuan explosion. And this explosion spread ash as far uh, north as Turkey and the, the coast of the Black Sea, and as far south as Egypt and as far inland as Syria. It's really remarkable. Uh, Crete uh, had ash deposited on it on its north coast in excess of 18 inches in depth. That's just devastating. There was also evidence of massive tidal waves that destroyed the ports on the north shore of Crete. So Crete got the brunt of this. You'll notice that because of the way the winds were going, uh, most of Greece was spared. So this was a massive ecological disaster for Crete. And many people suspect that this is the beginning of the end of the Cretan and Minoan civilization. Uh, it's hard to grow crops under 18 inches of ash, and it's harder to defend yourself when all your ships have been destroyed in the harbor. And after this point, the Minoans uh, will decline, and the uh, Greeks on the mainland will uh, begin to increase their, uh, you know, a power and, and the spread of their influence. Many people have suggested that maybe this cataclysmic destruction is the origin of the myth of Atlantis, and I think there's actually a, a few good points to be made there. So maybe this is this kind of echo of this memory. So when we get to Thera, uh, Thera has a city on it. This is the ancient city of Akrotiri, and this city was buried in this ashfall. So it must have been a devastating uh, destruction for them, uh, but it's great for us, archaeologists, hard-hearted monsters. Uh, you know, whatever was, everyone else is a disaster to them. It's like, whoopee! Uh, so, you know, save your children. Don't let them grow up to be archaeologists. Uh, have them grow up to be noble professions, like art historians instead. So, uh, we've only uncovered about a third of the city, but it's miraculously preserved. In fact, it's preserved up to the second story. Uh, it's now under this uh, shelter, uh, but you can see that many parts of the upper stories are preserved. And in fact, large pieces of carbonized wood were preserved, beds, lintels of door frames, etc. And that actually gives us a good sense of dating these things uh, through dendrochronology. Uh, wood uh, records the history of the tree it was cut from. And the tree has tree rings that represent growth cycles. And those growth cycles are like a fingerprint. They're very precise. You can have a, a thin ring or a thick ring, but the pattern of thin or thick rings is generally very um, indicative of uh, the climate. Well, we don't have a tree old enough to go back to that time period, but if you can get a tree that overlaps with an older tree, that overlaps with an older tree, you can see how these uh, overlap, and eventually you can match up the patterns where they align. And we've actually done that all the way to the wood recovered from this site. So this gives us a, a pretty good idea that you know this happened around the year 1600. There's also ice cores. Uh, volcanic ash goes into the sky. It filters all over the atmosphere. It falls out of the sky and it falls onto glaciers in places like Greenland and Iceland. And then that ash gets covered by a new snowfall. And then snowfalls happen year after year, and this gets compressed down into ice. If you take a core out of that, you can see that dirty layer, and you can count the number of layers above it, and you can 
get a pretty good guesstimate of where that uh, volcanic explosion happened. So through tree rings, dendrochronology, and ice cores, we have a pretty good idea of when this happened. But the more amazing thing is how well preserved the buildings are and the frescoes. Nearly every single room has beautiful frescoes in it. Some of them are actually in situ. That means they were still on the walls. Uh, some of them, most of them had fallen off the walls and had to be uh, reconstructed as here, but some of them were still on the walls. So we're going to look at a, uh, a few of them. Uh, the two big ones we're going to look at are Zesty 3 and the West House, but we're also going to look at, at uh, the Spring Fresco, which I think is in the Delta area. So the Spring Fresco is named the Spring Fresco because it seems to be the scene of spring of blossoms and flowers and uh, birds, uh, and it's really remarkable. This is one of the frescoes that was found in situ. We have no idea what this room was used for. It has a low shelf on the top, and then it has this wonderful undulating landscape of lilies and swallows. Uh, I always say this is the best evidence that Dr. Seuss uh, traveled back in time because, I mean, look at this fabulous landscape. It's just beautiful. The lily blossoms are really naturalistic. Sometimes they're just buds. Sometimes they're just starting to open. Other times they're all the way open, indicating that this artist really looked at lilies. Now, while we call this the spring fresco, we can't for certain say that the, the uh, season here is spring. Uh, because lilies blossom all summer long and into the fall in this part of the world. And uh, the birds here are swallows. You can see the birds right there. And they're really remarkable. They have this wonderful calligraphic style where each of the wings is made with a single brush uh, uh, stroke. It's really incredible. Love seeing how this swallow has his legs tucked up. And there's been various debates about what these swallows are doing. Some are saying they're building nests for the spring. Some of them are saying they're actually fighting for mates, and that would be a, a fall. It's hard to tell, but I think everybody was just over, uh, you know, uh, everyone was bowled over by the, the naturalism and the organic quality and the high quality of the painting. Zesty Three is one of the only places that we can say probably had a religious purpose even though it's a little bit mystifying. Uh, Zesty Three has two stories. In the lower story, there is one of these lustral basins for washing and anointing. And there is a depiction of a shrine with the horns of consecration. Pretty good evidence that this is some kind of shrine. There's also scenes of women. We're gonna start in the upper gallery. And in the upper gallery, we have these two women. And these two women are saffron gatherers. Here's a, a picture of the fresco as they reconstructed it. Here's the, the fresco, and it's just dazzlingly beautiful. Uh, so we still have this wonderful undulating landscape, but we also have crocus blossoms. Crocus blossoms are the first blossoms that bloom in the sp spring, and so these are definitely a, a spring time plant. And these young women are going out plucking the stamens from the crocus blossoms, and this the stamens is how we get the spice saffron. So this is very labor intensive. That explains why if you ever bought saffron, it's you know pretty darn expensive even today because it requires all this labor to carefully pluck uh, the stamens and the crocuses only uh, blossom in the spring. They're some of the first flowers to blossom in the spring, so it's a really kind of symbolic feature of that. When we look at these women, they have the beautiful flounced skirts. Uh, they have the jewelry hanging off of them. You can see the jewelry. But one thing you'll notice is the hairstyles are a bit different. This one has this blue head, and this represents a shaved head. And then she has this single lock. You'll also notice that she doesn't have any noticeable breasts. So this is a this girl over here is a prepubescent girl. This woman over here is just starting to get breasts. You notice that she has a very short haircut. So it seems to be a tradition that once they reached puberty, they would stop shaving their heads and allow uh, their hair to grow out fully. And so that's a very important feature of this, that we see a lot of uh, varying ages in the population. If we go to the lower scene down here, uh, we'll see older women. Now the woman over here has her head partially shaved 
and appears to be adolescent. She has the jewelry, but the neat thing here is she has this translucent veil that she's pulled over her whole body. You can see in the details that they've painted the clothes as see-through, these very, uh, you know, light, gauzy fabrics. Let's take a look at this woman over here. This woman is carrying a necklace of golden beads as an offering. She has a necklace of golden uh, lilies and this huge, uh, you know, hoop earrings. You can see how she has this gauzy uh, open bodice that's open and she has this fabulous skirt with all these patterns. She appears to be dancing. She has a full head of hair and she's very clearly fully developed. So she is a young, full, vibrant woman in the full flower of adulthood. And so again, it seems like that the younger girls are given lower tasks and the older women are, are giving higher tasks. This next woman, we're not entirely certain what's going on here, uh, but she seems to be tending to her foot and there's evidence of blood on her foot. Uh, maybe it's not blood, maybe it's anointing. You notice she has a hand to her head and she has uh, uh, like a laurel branch. All of this indicates this is some kind of ritual offering or anointing going on. We're not entirely certain. Remember, there is a lustral basin here, so this is where that anointing would take place. But then we have the younger girl on the other side. So maybe this is some kind of ritual uh, rite of passage. Uh, the crocus of the saffron gathering is kind of a, a clue. Saffron is an extraordinarily important spice in the ancient world. It's still an important spice today. It's used as a seasoning. Uh, it's also used as a medicine and as a dye. It's used to dye robes. Uh, and it's, yeah, there are some early recipes in the ancient Near East that call on using large quantities of saffron to bring about a woman's menstruation. So uh, that's an interesting uh, feature. And considering that we have all of these women, we have some women who seem to be older women uh, who are in a state of menopause, some who are just beginning uh, to menstruate, uh, others who are prepubescent. This seems to be some ritual about coming of age. Uh, something's going on. And the crocus is, is very, and the saffron is very significant to that. All of this ultimately leads to this scene over here, and in this scene we have an offering scene. Uh, it's kind of hard to see in the original, but here in the reconstruction you can see we have another young woman, this one with short hair, uh, who is offering a basket of uh, saffron. And this saffron is being presented by a blue monkey. Uh, blue monkeys are often seen in Near Eastern art as attendants to the gods, so that is pretty good indication uh, along with the raised dais here, this throne, that this is some kind of goddess. Uh, and if you didn't know that for certain, uh, there's a griffin behind her. And every time we see a griffin, that's kind of an indication that this is a, a goddess. When we look at this in detail and take a look at these uh, figures, you can see how uh, really wonderfully drawn they are. I want to point out many of these figures are not shown from the front that their shoulders are rolled to the side. They have these very dynamic, very organic, very naturalistic depictions. You can see all of her fabulous jewelry of dragonflies and ducks, these enormous hoop earrings, as well as jewelry and beads, woven, golden beads woven into her hair. Uh, blue is usually used to show silver in this case, and yellow and red is used to show gold. And then the griffin behind her is just kind of a, a big clue that this is, uh, this is a goddess, that we are entering into a divine space. But other than that, we can't say anything really concrete. Um, this is obviously some kind of cultic space, but and it's again associated with these fabulous women, but other than that, we don't know. The other major site is the West House. And the West House is again full of many different frescoes. But the frescoes are really kind of interesting because they show scenes of everyday life. Here we have a scene of a fisherman, a young boy. Notice he has the shaved head too, indicating that he is just now coming out of puberty uh, or in, you know, he's transitioning. Notice that again, his shoulders aren't quite frontal. Notice that the eye is not quite a profile eye, not quite a frontal eye, but halfway in between. We see them moving into this direction. 
but there's no sense of what this scene is for other than it's just a beautiful scene of everyday life. Um, you can see that he's carrying fish. These are the same kind of fish that if you go to the fish market at Santorini, they're still serving these kind of fish. It's kind of amazing. We also see scenes of boys boxing. Uh, again, just seems to be a way of, of capturing everyday life. One of the more remarkable frescoes is the miniature frieze. Miniature frieze wraps around three sides of the house. Uh, the fourth wall got knocked down, so maybe it got utterly destroyed and we don't have it. The north wall shows what appears to be an invasion. Uh, the east wall has a nilotic scene, a river with cats and ducks and griffins. And the south wall has a flotilla, uh, a procession of ships. Let's start with the north wall. The north wall starts with the kind of meeting on the hill of guys in long cloaks who appear to be elders. But then we move into a town, and at the town, uh, there appears to be ships coming ashore. But are there men swimming, or are these victims of a shipwreck? And then coming out of the ship is a collection of soldiers. So the meeting on the hill is kind of mystifying. But the soldiers are carrying those tower shields, those oxhide shields, and they have boar's tooth helmets. Boar's tooth helmets are things we only associate with Mycenaeans and with Greeks. Uh, here's a little ivory sculpture that shows how this works. The boar's teeth are split and drilled and, and sewn onto a leather cap. If you read the Iliad, uh, Odysseus is always putting on his boar's tooth helmet, and for the longest time, people thought this was just fantasy. They thought this was just mythology, like a sword made of an indestructible iron, or, or it was just this magical thing. Nope, they actually made helmets out of boar's teeth, and we never would have known that had we not dug it up. So it's a pre pretty good indi indication that these are Mycenaeans. But are they just returning home, or are they invading? It's a big debate. On the next wall, wall, wall we have a, uh, a huge scene of a river. And on this river, we have griffins and cats chasing after geese and ducks. Notice that we have a papyri plant and palm trees. That seems to indicate that this is on the Nile in Egypt. Um, but, you know, maybe not. The final scene shows two towns uh, and in between these towns is a large flotilla of ships. We'll start with Departure Town. The Departure Town has uh, a river coming into the town, and then it seems to have a stream that empties out into the harbor, and the stream has two branches. So maybe this is an island off of the coast of the town. We don't know. Uh, everybody in the town is gathered together to watch uh, people depart, uh, and only one of the ships down here actually shows people rowing. They're actually facing opposite the direction that they are heading. Uh, all of the other ships are strangely paddling. Now, paddling is the way you paddle a canoe. You face forward and you reach over the boat and paddle. That was not the way that people did things anciently, or at least not we thought, until we found this fresco. Uh, the ships are all decked out to the nines. They have garlands and uh, festoons. They have a ship's cabin. And back in the ship's cabin, we have the captain. Uh, and elsewhere in the West House, we have actual ship cabins painted on the wall. So maybe this is a captain of a ship. And he is, you know, painting some story from his life. We also have hanging up on the ship's cabin... Uh, another one of these boar's tooth helmets, so that's indication that these are Mycenaeans. Only one of the ships is actually under sail. That seems to indicate that they're not going very far. There are dolphins gambling about in the surf in the wake of the ships. And finally, this ship comes into the harbor with its very beautifully painted rocks and into a town that seems anxiously to meet them with everyone lined up on the shore, uh, eager to greet them. And sure enough, we have our prominent women are there. So is this an invasion? Is this a ceremony? 
Is this people traveling from one island to another, or are they going from just one town on the same island to another town? Nobody quite knows. And maybe it's a history, or maybe it's just a beautiful scene. Well, this raises the question of who are the Therans? Uh, it's important to note that they use native pottery, so it's possible that they are native Cycladic peoples and that they're just borrowing these cultural influences from the Minoans or the Mycenaeans. Uh, it's possible they're a Minoan colony. Uh, the women in ritual and the flounce skirts and jackets definitely seems to indicate a Minoan influence. Uh, also, the paintings are very beautiful. Uh, unlike the women at Pylos, which are very stiff and very flat and very rigid, uh, these are very organic and very naturalistically painted. That seems to be much more like what we're seeing on the island of Crete, so that would argue that this is a Minoan artist. But then we have Mycenaean warriors with oxhide shields and boar's tooth helmets. Um, that's just bizarre because those are things we only know from the Mycenaean period. So it's anybody's bet, but it's obvious that this was a far more dynamic environment than we ever could have guessed, and we never would have known it had we not discovered Thera. Which brings us to the end of the Aegean. By the time we get to the end of the Aegean, uh, the Mycenaeans seem to have dominated the entire Aegean. The Minoans are in decline, uh, the Cyclades are dominated, and we have these massive uh, cities and forts all over the Peloponnese and uh, the Attic uh, Peninsula. So we have a, a huge confederation, probably ruled by the Wanox or single ruler uh, in Mycenae. But then a new group of people emerge, uh, a group of people we call Troy, but more accurately are called uh, Ilios or Ilium. Uh, if you've ever read the Iliad, the Iliad is about the battle that they fought with the Ilios and Ilium is the region around the city of Troy. So Troy is the city, but Ilios is the people, and Ilium is the, the region. Uh, and so that's why the Iliad is called the Iliad, is the battle of the uh, amongst the Ilios. And they seem to be a rising power, and very interestingly, they have control over the Bosporus. And the Bosporus is this strait right here that allows them access to the Black Sea. Let me just back up to another map to make this a little bit more clear. So if we look at this map, here's Troy, and they control the Hellespont, which is the Bosporus, uh, which is this series of straits that take you into the Black Sea. So they seem to have had exclusive control over um, that territory and the trade coming out of that territory. That probably made them a threat to the Mycenaeans because the Mycenaeans pretty much hated anything they didn't control. And this brings us to the Trojan War. Well, according to Greek legend, the Trojan War is started by a golden apple. Eris, the goddess of strife, uh, throws a golden apple of discord amongst the three uh, highest ranking goddesses, Athena, the goddess of wisdom, Hera, the goddess of, uh, of queens and kings and powers, and Aphrodite, the goddess of love and fertility. And the apple says, to the fairest of all the goddesses. Well, they all think that they deserve it, and they can't decide the matter for themselves, so the gods decide to let a prince of Troy, by the name of Paris, decide the matter for them. And of course, none of the goddesses want to play fair. Athena uh, uh, tries to bribe Paris and says, if you give me the apple, I'll make you the wisest man on earth. Uh, Hera says, if you give me the apple, I'll make you the most powerful man on earth. And Aphrodite says, if I give you, if you give me the apple, I'll give you the hottest babe on the planet. So of course, the dumb idiot picks Aphrodite. Uh, fortunately, the hottest uh, babe on the planet is actually Helen, Helen of Sparta. Sparta's down in this region right here, and Helen already has a husband, Menelaus, and Menelaus is the king of Sparta, and he is the brother to Agamemnon. Now, according to some of the legends, Helen goes away will, uh, you know, willingly with Paris. In other legends, she didn't go away willingly. But either way, uh, Menelaus um, sees this as a great insult, so he goes to his brother, 
and his brother pledges to return his wife to him. And so because Agamemnon is the one ox, he is the leader of the Federation, they all go to war. And for 10 years, they fight this absolutely destructive suicidal war against Troy. And of course, ultimately, Troy falls. You've heard the story of the Trojan horse. Uh, the Trojans let the horse into the city and the Greeks are hiding inside. You can see them hiding here in this uh, decoration from a vase. And it ends in the destruction of Troy. But what you may not have known is shortly after that, we have the complete and total destruction of every Mycenaean fort and city uh, in a very short period of time, less than 50 years. And no one's entirely certain why. Uh, maybe it was sparked by the Trojan War, maybe not, but something happened, and shortly after the Trojan War, uh, all of Mycenaean civilization comes to an abrupt halt. And this causes the Greek Dark Ages, where for 500 years, or for nearly 500 years, we have almost no civilization or culture, uh, nothing more than small villages of goat herders in Greece. And it has wider ranging uh, implications as well. Uh, the consequences on the entire Eastern Mediterranean are profound. But we'll talk about that next time. I know this one was long. Uh, I usually break this up into a couple parts, but uh, I just had to get through this. This is the third time, and hopefully everything went well. Okay, thanks so much for all your patience.